On January 25th, 2024, Alabama made capital punishment history for executing Kenneth Eugene Smith with an untested method that has never been used before, nitrogen hypoxia. The United Nations said that this could lead to a torturous death, but was it all justified for his part in a torturous killing? Welcome to The Last Supper. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 6 of The Last Supper, a true crime podcast. My name is Colson Davis and I am an amateur chef, a true crime junkie, a music and video producer, and a content creator. Every other week on this podcast, I will be telling you a true death penalty case story and at the same time, I will be cooking that criminal's last requested meal before they were executed. This week, we are doing our first ever double last meal. That's right, we're going to be cooking two different last meals for two different people who committed the same crime. Crime. First, we're looking at Kenneth Eugene Smith, whose last meal consisted of a T-bone steak, eggs, and hash browns from Waffle House. And next, we're looking at John Forrest Parker. Now, what did I tell you about the Johns out there? We've had six episodes so far, and three of them have been Johns. That is a 50% chance that John is a murderer. So... Watch the Johns in your life, kids. Anyway, his last meal consisted of fried fish, fries, and iced tea. You can find all the recipes I've written for this podcast at lastsupperpodcast.com slash blog. And of course, I got to shout out the Country Butcher for giving me these beautiful T-bone steaks for today's episode. You know the drill. They're an amazing local butchery with tons of high quality meats and so much more. I will link all their stuff down in the description. Check them out. Now, let's dive into the case of Kenneth Eugene Smith and John Forrest Parker. Knock, knock, knock. It's March 18th, 1988, and Elizabeth Sennett was home alone when two men knocked on the door. She answered and was asked if they could look around the wooded property behind her home as a hunting ground. The men told her that her husband, Charles Sennett, had given them permission already. She was skeptical since the men barely knew Charles's name, so she excused herself to call her husband. Charles confirmed with Elizabeth that he gave the men permission and to let them go ahead and look around, and off the men went into the wooded area behind the single family home in Colbert County, Alabama. A little while later, the men knocked on the door again, and the one man asked Elizabeth if he could use the bathroom, which she agreed to. Elizabeth made small talk with the one man before the other emerged from the bathroom with socks on his hands. He made his way behind Elizabeth and started beating her. The men used many different objects from around the house, including all the pieces of a fireplace set, a cane, and a piece of galvanized pipe. Elizabeth begged for the men to stop her hurting her as she was rolled into a rug. The one man started looking for valuables around the house as the other took out a large hunting knife and stabbed Elizabeth eight times through the rug. Elizabeth started praying for the men and they decided to flee the scene. A simple robbery gone horribly wrong or was it something much darker? So, who are the Senates? Elizabeth and Charles were a small-town nuclear Christian family. Elizabeth Dorleen Senate was born on December 10, 1942 in Cleveland, Ohio, and she met and got married to Charles Senate, and they decided to move to Tennessee, where Charles went to preaching school. Yes, it's called preaching school for some reason, and not vocational school. I'm not sure. After this, they moved over to a small town in Alabama that was within Colbert County. She and Charles had two sons together, Charles Sennett Jr., who goes by Chuck, and Mike Sennett. Chuck described that, quote, Elizabeth never held a full-time job that I remember, but she was a homemaker, housewife, mother, confidant, best friend. However, you want to think of your mother. She was a smart woman, a preacher's wife, had good values. She had me and my brother towing the line. She wasn't really strict, but she she taught us right from wrong. However, things started to get strained financially, being a small town pastor. Charles started a bit of a side hustle and began selling funeral vaults, which is what coffins go in before they are put in the ground. After a while, Charles was under extreme pressure and one day Elizabeth and their son couldn't get a hold of Charles. They went down to his office and they found him curled up on the floor amidst a nervous breakdown. Because of this, Charles had to give up preaching for a few years and Elizabeth became the breadwinner and took care of her sons and her husband who was mentally unwell. Like, what an absolute angel this woman is. My God. 
Anyway, Charles was a generational pastor, and this was extremely hard on him. After a while, he did begin preaching again, and his sons were out of the house. Their oldest son, Chuck, found a wife and started a family, and he had just moved back from being in the Navy around the time that Elizabeth was attacked. Charles Sennett returned home to find his wife severely beaten and bloodied and called the sheriff's department. The police rushed to the house to find that Elizabeth was still alive. When the deputies told Charles his wife was still alive, he looked shocked and his eyes went wide. There are a couple different accounts, but some say Elizabeth died en route to the hospital or she died after arriving and receiving medical attention. Either way, she sadly passed away. One EMT knew the sentence, and when he saw Elizabeth's body, he said that he wouldn't have even recognized her without someone telling him. The police started searching the house, and at the first look over, they thought that this could have been a robbery gone wrong. There was some broken glass, and the house was messy. Elizabeth's daughter-in-law said that there was a VCR player that was missing from the home. However, that was all that was taken, leading the police to suspect more was going on than what met the eye. They started looking further and confirmed their suspicions when they found several valuables around the house untouched and $400 still in Elizabeth's wallet. This was not a robbery. They kept searching the property and they soon found a pond located behind the house. They searched the murky water and found all the murder weapons, including their survival knife, fireplace tools, and the pipe. They also recovered a hat found at the scene and hair samples. They then found a Valentine's Day card in the home from Charles that was addressed to a woman named Doris, a lady from the church where Charles preached. The police now suspected that there was an ongoing affair between Charles and this woman for some time. So about a week after the murder, the police brought Charles in for questioning and asked about the card. He claimed that he had nothing to do with his wife's murder and he was free to leave. Charles was shaking up and was feeling a lot of pressure from the investigation. He then got all his children together, Chuck and his wife, and Mike. He had them gather at the church. He explained to them that he had been having an affair with Doris from the church, and the children were obviously very upset with all of this. They were all leaving the church, and Charles and Mike made eye contact with each other, and Charles then got into his truck when the kids heard a gunshot. The stress of the debt, the affair, the shame from his family, and now the pressure from the police led Charles Sr. to shoot himself in the chest with his rifle. He was dead when the police arrived. So now the police have no suspects since their prime suspect is now dead. So they decided to raise the reward money to anyone with information that leads to arrests from $1,000 to $10,000. And three days later, someone calls. They told the police three names, and that's Billy Williams, John Parker, and Kenneth Smith. The police searched Kenneth's house and they found a VCR player and they were somehow able to match the serial numbers to the Senate household. They brought Kenneth into the station for questioning and he immediately folded after hearing the evidence and gave the police a detailed written statement on everything that happened. However, later at trial, the men tried to blame each other for the crime, of course. The prosecution said, quote, they always tell the story in the light most favorable to them. It's not an uncommon thing on a scene like this, on a crime scene where a person is still alive to hear this gurgling sound of a person still trying to force air into their lungs. So what the hell happened? Well, earlier in 1988, Charles was having severe financial problems like we talked about and the affair with Doris. He wasn't making enough money as a small town pastor and his marriage just wasn't enough. Charles and Elizabeth were renting out a space somewhere, so Charles asked one of his tenants, Billy Gray Williams, for some help. He offered William $3,000 if he could murder his wife Elizabeth, which Williams said he could get somebody. Charles could then collect insurance money, which he just bought for his wife to solve his financial problems and solve the issues of the affair. Now, I'm going to add a little segment here called saving for murder. I think it's always funny to hear financial problems being an excuse for murder, and especially when they take a large sum of money to pay for a hitman instead of taking care of the financial problems. It's so ironic. So I did a bunch of math and figured out how long it would take for Charles to save for murder. Now, as a disclaimer here, I found out later in my research that Charles borrowed the money from Doris and he was going to pay her back with the life insurance, but I already did all this math and this is just for fun if you like numbers like me. If you don't, just skip ahead a couple minutes. Uh, there's timestamps in the video and on Spotify. 
I found that an average pastor's salary in Alabama as of today is about $57,922, about $4,826 a month, $1,113 a week, or $27.85 an hour. Now let's convert all of this to 1988 money to put it all in perspective. Regardless, this isn't that bad of an income. Average income in America as of 2024 is about $59,000 to $63,000. A pastor's average yearly salary in 1988 would have been about $21,728.94, $1,810.43 a month, $417.53 a week, or about $10.45 an hour. Now, if we take $3,000 he had to chuck up for the murder, that would mean he would have to work with zero expenses at all for about 1.657 months or about one month and 20-ish days. Now that's without expenses at all. He had a wife at home and a house, so assumingly a mortgage and utilities, and I'm sure he had business expenses to worry about with maintenance of the church. So let's say he was a good financial advocate and he saved 10% of his income and used the rest for expenses. That would be about $181.4 four cents per month that he'd be able to save. That would mean it would take him about 16.57 months or about one year, four months and 18 days to save $3,000. Almost a year and a half of consistently saving 10%. Now, let's say he decided to make sure he could track this money in a good savings account. In the 80s, the average savings account had around a 10% APY, which is so crazy knowing that today it's under 1% percent. It's nuts. Anyway, if he kept putting the $181.04 in per month, he would be able to save the $3,000 needed in about 16.32 months or about one year, four months, and 10 days. This would mean he could get the needed $3,000 eight days earlier if he put it into a savings account compared to keeping it in cash. So let me know if you would do the cash or the savings account and why. Leave a comment below. Let's have some fun. And remember, next time that you're in a desperate situation, ask yourself, is it worth saving for murder? So to make this clear one more time, Charles got the money from Doris, who is the woman he was having an affair with, and offered to give the $3,000 to Billy Gray Williams. Billy wasn't sure about doing this himself, so he found Kenneth Eugene Smith. Nothing is really known about Kenneth, but we do know he was born on July 4th, 1965 in Alabama. Billy and Kenny then started to discuss the murder and decided to also recruit John Forrest Parker, who we know was a drug addict. Before asking Parker to help, Kenny asked another friend to help, but he declined. The friend testified later in court and said that Kenny approached him saying that he had a way to make some fast cash and that they just had to hurt this old lady or something. Thing. The men use this as proof of innocence because they claim that they weren't sure if they were supposed to just beat up Elizabeth or not until a few days before the murder where all the men sat down for a meal to discuss the final details. Kenny and John also claimed that they didn't know they were supposed to hurt Charles' wife. At this meal, Charles gave John and Kenny $200 to purchase a gun and other equipment for the murder, and he showed the men the rest of the $3,000, which they would all split after the murder. The plan was in place, so John decided to take his money and purchase drugs with it instead of a gun. So now we're back to the murder. Before leaving for the murder, John Parker shot up the drugs he had purchased with his $200, and he got in the driver's seat and started driving him and Kenny. Kenny was occupied by sharpening a large hunter's knife they intended to use for the murder. There's speculations that Kenny also used drugs, but it's not confirmed. However, John's drug use is confirmed because he confessed to this later to the police. So, the men knocked on the door, as we know, and searched the woods. When John and Kenny went into the woods, they stayed out there for quite a while, and we can only assume they were trying to prepare themselves and discussing final details. When they came back to use the bathroom, John is the one who went into 
to the bathroom to put socks on his hand. The men were supposed to have gloves, but I can guess that the $200 were supposed to be for gloves too, but I guess socks work. Kenny was distracting Elizabeth with small talk when John came out from behind and started the beating. Both men beat Elizabeth, but after rolling her in the rug, Kenny started to look for valuables and to make it look like a robbery. After this, the men fled the scene and later Charles entered and found his wife. Full circle moment right here. So when the sheriff told Charles his wife was still alive, he wasn't shocked in a good way, but he was horrified. After this, the sheriff kept a close eye on Charles and realized he knew Charles from somewhere. A few weeks earlier, there was another murder in the town, I think at a store of some kind, but I'm not sure. The sheriff was thinking on this and realized that Charles was at the crime scene and was watching the police conduct their investigations and was seeing what they were doing. He was not involved in this murder, but the sheriff took note of it and stated it was odd. Looking back on it, the sheriff suspected that Charles was possibly trying to gain some insight into a murder investigation and tailor his wife's scene in a more efficient way, which worked out so well. But this is all speculative. Also, that hat they found at the scene with hair was not Charles's. But the hair did match either John or Parker, which also helped link them to the crime. Billy Gray Williams was charged with conspiracy to commit murder, later getting it changed to murder. He was sentenced to life in prison and was sent to Donaldson Correction Facility in Jefferson County. He recently died in prison in 2020 from natural causes. Now, John Parker was charged with capital murder and was taken to trial. His defense tried to argue that John wasn't trying to murder Elizabeth and he roughed her up and then when Charles arrived home, he saw his wife alive and Charles stabbed her to death. This didn't work though and the jury deliberated and found him guilty and they recommended a sentence of life in prison. However, in the state of Alabama, the judge can make the final ruling regardless of the jury recommendations and John Parker was sentenced to death. John was taken to death row at Holman Prison in Altmore and was housed there until June 10th, 2010, his execution day. Several days before his execution, John appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court after the Alabama Supreme Court rejected his stay of execution 7-2. to two. John tried arguing that it was unconstitutional for the trial judge to have awesome power to override the jury's recommendation of a life sentence. The state argued that John had already used this plea and it's been denied, furthering that it was legal for this to happen in Alabama law and that the judge carefully considered the jury's recommendation before sentencing. The United States rejected his plea and the execution went ahead. John refused breakfast in the morning and was placed in a holding cell. He spent the day meeting friends and family including his mother and father, Joanne and Edward Parker. He gave his possessions to several family members including a gold watch, a mirror, stamps, a belt, a wallet, and a box of pictures. He ate his final meal later in the day consisting of fried fish, french fries, and iced tea. The prison said that he was calm during the lethal injection process and he was pronounced dead at 6.41 p.m. Now, Kenneth Smith. He was tried last and his trial got a change of venue since after the John Parker and Billy Williams trial, it was a very well-known case in the area and the courts decided it would be best to move the trial. The case was pretty cut and dry, especially with his full confession. The state called Kenneth's friend to testify and he said that the day after the murder, he went to Kenneth's house and noticed that he had an unusually large amount of money that he thought was in $20 denomination. Kenneth told his friend that he got the money from his tax return. The one friend that declined to participate was also called to testify against Kenneth. All damning evidence and the jury found him guilty of capital murder and they recommended a sentence of death with a majority 10 to 2 vote and Kenneth was sentenced by the judge to death. In the state of Alabama, a judge can overrule a jury's recommendation and determine the final sentence like we talked about with John. And this is a very similar process to what happened in the Amber McLaughlin case. And if you haven't heard that one, I suggest you go check it out. It's a crazy story. It's about the first ever transgender individual put to death in American history. I'll leave a little card up in the video. Kenneth tried to appeal that the jury didn't understand reasonable doubt. It really didn't work at all. The state argued that reasonable doubt is pretty self-explanatory. They said that the state did not have to convince a jury beyond 
all doubt and that the jury couldn't acquit someone just because they had slight doubt. They had to, beyond reasonable moral doubt, find someone not guilty, which in this case they literally had his confession. Now, about the confession, Kenneth tried to argue that the admission of his confession into the courtroom violated his Fifth and Fourth Amendment rights. He claimed he was coerced into the confession because he wasn't informed that he was being questioned for the murder, only that he was being questioned about the VCR and that the officers used a form of trickery to get him to confess. The state argues, though, that he was given his Miranda rights and that just because he wasn't questioned specifically about the murder, he started talking about it on his own free will and that the officer's silence is not a form of trickery. However, Kenneth's appeal also brought up a strong point. In the sentencing, the trial court failed to enter specific written facts and conclusions as to the mitigating and aggravating circumstances as required by some code in Alabama. The appeals court didn't have any way to review the facts of the sentencing process that the judge used and therefore the appeals court reversed his sentence and he was scheduled for a resentencing trial. Now, in this next trial, short and sweet, the jury deliberated and recommended a sentence of life in prison, 11 to 1. However, the trial judge thought that Kenneth needed to be sentenced to death again. He kept attempting to appeal after this for the next couple decades and now we get to some more current times. So in 2017, Alabama became the last state to remove the judge's ability to impose a death sentence regardless of a jury recommendation. And the jury had to, from then on, have a unanimous vote to put somebody to death. However, this new ruling was not retroactive, meaning that cases before this ruling were not affected. Now we get to Kenneth's first execution. Yes, the first of two. Now, let me explain. On November November 17th, 2022, Kenneth was set to be executed by lethal injection. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit Council for the Alabama Department of Corrections was finally reviewing Kenneth's case as he was getting prepped to be executed. At 7.45 p.m., Kenneth's case was pending and he had one last call with his wife, which I never heard about a wife before, so this dude got a wife in prison. Anyway, guards hung up his call at 7.57 and he was placed in handcuffs and leg bars and taken to the execution chamber where he was strapped to the gurney. A couple minutes later, a stay of execution was placed on Kenneth's execution and his lawyers contacted the Alabama Department of Corrections, which we're going to call the ADOC, with the news. They simply replied, noted. I don't know what the ADOC was thinking or what their motivations were, but after they kept Kenneth strapped to the gurney for four more hours. This entire time, Kenneth was not allowed to speak to his lawyers and was never informed of the stay or updated on any other legal proceedings regarding his case. He thought he was going to die. At around 10 p.m., the ADOC sent in the IV team and attempted to place an intravenous line for the drugs. Now, around this time, the 11th Circuit lifted the stay of execution and granted the team until 12 a.m. midnight to finish the execution. Now, when there's an execution, the execution team has a certain time frame where they must fully be done with the execution before the death warrant expires and they must stop. Now, going back, it is unknown if the IV team started poking at Kenneth before or after the stay of execution was lifted. It's said that the Supreme Court lifted the stay at 10.20 p.m. We will never know. But in these two hours, Kenny was poked with needles over and over with no success in finding a suitable vein. Kenneth attempted to tell the team member that they were putting the needles in his muscles, in which they responded, quote, no, I'm not. After this, the execution team turned Kenneth upside down on the gurney, and he was in an inverted crucifix position and was left there for several minutes alone. He was then injected with an unknown substance in his arm. Someone then came into the room and started jabbing Kenneth's collarbone repeatedly trying to set a central IV line. Around 11.20, rumors circulated that the execution was called off, and Kenneth's lawyer emailed the department to confirm that had 
been, but they never got a response. Shortly before midnight and after many unsuccessful attempts to place a line, the execution team told Kenneth, quote, it's over with. When guards removed him from the gurney, Kenneth was unable to move his arms up to be handcuffed or walk without any support. This was the third consecutive botched lethal injection attempt in the state of Alabama in the past year of 2022. Because of these incidents, the Alabama governor, Kay Ivey, called for a review of the execution process. She also wanted to approve giving ADOC more time in a death warrant to do an execution, and this was approved on January 12, 2023. The entire execution process was approved in February of 2023, and executions were allowed to continue as usual. So there's the first execution attempt. With Kenneth's next execution, his counsel pushed for an alternative method of execution to be used known as nitrogen hypoxia. Now, this method is where they would place a mask over the person's face and force them to breathe pure nitrogen gas, causing asphyxiation and death. Alabama did make nitrogen hypoxia an alternative form of execution in 2018 because the state was consistently having problems with getting the drugs for lethal injections. Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Alabama are the only three states at the time of this episode to have nitrogen hypoxia as an alternative to the federal default of lethal injection. On January 10th, 2024, Kenneth's execution using nitrogen hypoxia was approved and he was set to be executed on the 25th of January. Kenneth tried to appeal saying that the new method would be unconstitutional because attempting to execute him twice could be cruel and unusual punishment, but this was denied and the execution pushed forward. As the hype of this execution got bigger, more and more opinions started surfacing. Kenneth's spiritual advisor, Reverend Jeff Hood, spoke of many concerns he had about the new process. He told CNN, quote, The process obviously is designed to execute Kenneth Smith, but the way that they're constructing this, the way that they're doing it, the way that they're being silent, the way that they're holding back information, yes, it's incredibly concerning and should be incredibly concerning for everybody in the room. Another big argument made by protesters of the execution cited facts that many veterinarian scientists have ruled out nitrogen gas as a euthanasian method due to ethical reasons. They furthered this by saying that it is discouraged for most mammals because it can lead to distress, panic, and other seizure-like behaviors. Elizabeth Sennett's son were also speaking their opinions. Mike Sennett explained that, quote, it seems like a lot of the focus today is on Smith and his nitrogen, whatever process, and that kind of upsets us a little bit. Chuck Sennett added, quote, some of these people out here say, quote, well, he doesn't need to suffer like that. Well, he didn't ask mama how to suffer. They just did it. On the day of the execution, Kenneth ate his last meal consisting of eggs, hash browns, and a T-bone steak from the Waffle House. After many last-minute appeals were rejected, Kenneth was prepped for execution. Kenneth was dressed in a tan prison jumpsuit and he was taken into the execution chamber and was trapped to a gurney. He was then partially covered with a white sheet. At 7.53, the curtains between the viewing room and the chamber opened. A large blue rimmed face mask was already placed over his face from his forehead to his chin. The prison warden stepped into the chamber and read Kenneth's death warrant and then held a microphone to Kenneth for his last words. Quote, Tonight, Alabama causes humanity to take a step backwards. I'm leaving with love, peace, and light. Love all of you, as he made an I love you sign with his fingers to his family members. The attorney general then gave the ADOC the green light to follow through with the execution. Kenneth, spiritual advisor, approached Kenneth and started praying with him. At 7.58, Kenneth started to shake and writhe violently and then visibly moved the gurney. He pulled on the arm restraints and lifted his head. He dropped his head back down and his wife started crying. Kenneth was then seen taking long, gasping breaths, and at 8.08, his chest stopped moving. The curtains were closed at 8.15, and state officials said that they pronounced Kenneth dead at 8.25. The state has declined to discuss when the nitrogen started flowing or when Kenneth's heart rate monitor proved his heart had stopped. The news of the execution confirmed to many that the new method was indeed cruel and unusual and did not bring the quick and painless death they hoped. 
This has raised many questions to whether the nitrogen hypoxia execution method will be used again or if it'll just get modified for better effectiveness. What are your thoughts on the nitrogen hypoxia method? Leave a comment below. But I want to end this story with some words from the victim's family that are truly powerful. After the execution, Mike Sennett, who was joined with his brother Chuck Sennett, said, quote, nothing happened here today that's going to bring mom back. Nothing. It's kind of a bittersweet day. We're not going to be jumping around hooting and hollering hooray and all that. That's not us, but we're glad this day is over. All three of the people involved in this case years ago, we have forgiven. Not today, but we have in the past. Some people may not believe that, you know, how do you forgive somebody? Well, for it to be more Christ-like, try to live his teachings and stuff, he forgave the ones on the cross, right? The thieves. And if I'm trying to live my life like him, it is my duty and it is a weight off my shoulders. I forgive him. I forgive him for what he's done. I don't like what he done, but they are forgiven from us. The Bible says evil deeds has consequences, and Kenneth Smith made some bad decisions 35 years ago, and his debt was paid tonight. Some of you may have heard us talk about over and over about 35 years. 35 years. Kenneth Smith, Parker, Williams. Williams not so much because he died in the system, but Parker and Smith have been incarcerated almost twice as long as I knew my mom. Elizabeth Doreen Thorne Senate got her justice tonight. And with that, John Parker and Kenneth Smith's sentences were served. All right, so I lost the audio at the end of this when I was eating my meal and doing the outro, my last final thoughts. So my final thoughts on the entire story, the case of Kenneth Smith, John Parker, Billy Williams, all of it. I'm just gonna keep my opinions to myself here. I have mixed emotions on this entire thing, but I'm gonna stay neutral. You guys go right ahead, debate in the comments, tell me what your opinions are. I'd love to hear them. I will engage in every comment that I get. Comment below what your thoughts are. All right, now for this meal here. Um, so we tried the steak, we tried the eggs and the hash browns. It was interesting trying the Waffle House hash browns with the onions and cheese on it. I've never had them that way. Really good. Steak was delicious, juicy as always, you know, basting it in that butter and the herbs and stuff really does wonders for steak. You need to try it. Eggs, they're just eggs. They're really delicious fluffy, all that. The tea here, this was really interesting with the, the preserve here. It was really good. And the fish, so crunchy, so delicious. And the homemade tartar sauce, oh my lord, you have to try this homemade tartar sauce. It is so good. The fries, the wedges, they are also super good. What a great double last meal. This was so exciting to do. I loved it. And you can find this recipe at lastsupperpodcast.com slash blog. All right, and that concludes this episode of The Last Supper, wherever you're watching or listening make sure you follow me or subscribe and on most platforms you can get me upwards of a five-star review i'd really appreciate appreciate that get the show up the charts um, also tell your friends tell your family that's the best way to spread the show if you're on youtube i recommend you watch this video i think you'll really like that one and until then make sure you enjoy every meal because you never know when it'll be your last